Did you have in your classroom then? Yes. Very attractive 23-year-old teacher. He's had with you. Weren't you scared to death he would tell someone? Obviously not, because I did it again. And again. And again. When we think of school, we envision a safe haven for learning and growth. But sometimes the very educators we trust harbor sinister intentions toward their students. Intentions that shock the world when revealed to the public. Here are 10 disturbing interviews with evil school teachers. Stephanie, you touched her inappropriately. Do you remember that incident? Yeah. Seated in a blue shirt and beige pants is 19-year-old teacher Asher Syed Yassin. Denying the allegations put forward against him by the female officer seated in front of him. But in the next few minutes, his chilling confession will send shockwaves down your spine. Now for context, Asher worked as a teacher for several months at the Islamic Center of Osceola County before he was hired by the district as a substitute. Now before he was hired, Asher was given a list of teaching roles available to him, ranging from pre-kindergarten to high school. He marked his top 10 choices, all of which involved teaching elementary school students or kindergartners. So before he was even hired, we can see where his sadistic mind is heading towards. And in roughly two months of working at this district, he tutored at six different schools until his perverted actions were uncovered. March 1st, 2019. Parents of a student at Boggy Creek Elementary reported to school officials that their daughter had been molested by Asher. The school immediately launched this investigation, and while it was ongoing, more students from other schools came forward, exposing their troubling encounters with Asher, including a student from a Florida elementary school whose testimony led to his prosecution. According to this student, Asher occasionally said he found him beautiful and attractive. In one class, the girl said she was taking a test and had a question, so Asher summoned her to his desk, where she sat in a chair next to him. He told her to stand up and allegedly began touching her inappropriately behind the desk while restraining her hands with his arm. In this other class, a victim said that Asher began touching her while explaining an assignment as he was sitting at his chair and she was standing next to him. His lewd acts got so disturbing that this student had to make excuses about needing to drink water just so she could get out of that class and avoid getting touched any further. I mean... It's pretty sick. The victim would also say that she saw Asher inappropriately touch her friend and possibly another student while they were also behind his desk. More students would come forward after the district notified parents of his arrest in this automated call. And during interrogation, this happened. Saying that you, you put your, your hands inside her pants and her buttocks. Her butt. Yeah. That's not true. At first, Asher tried lying to the detective by claiming the stories about his actions weren't true. However, after she probed him a little further, he confessed. Tell me what happened. Inside her pants? Yep. And then dropped the main bombshell. Did you put your fingers inside her butt? What do you do when you put your hand inside her pants or skirt or whatever she was wearing? I mean, that's just disturbing to even listen to. But it might interest you to know that Asher only got eight years of jail time for his crimes. He initially faced a dozen child station charges, but pleaded not guilty to four lesser counts of attempted lewd and lascivious station on a person under the age of 12. Each charge carried a maximum penalty of 15 years in prison, but a plea agreement with the state resulted in an eight-year sentence and a $2,500 fine. Guys, remember that this guy was accused of molesting at least eight students. So was the judge lenient or did he really get the appropriate sentence? It's a little girl. It's illegal. It's not okay. And I, and I really hope that justice is you realize that? Yeah. Very attractive 23-year-old teacher. He's had sex with you. Weren't you scared to death he would tell someone? Obviously not, because I did it again. A top contender for the title of America's most evil school teacher, and the woman described as a gorgeous disaster, Deborah Lefebvre left her perfect life as a noble teacher and a wife to become the subject of scrutiny after engaging in lewd acts with a student in her class. 
However, LaFay felt not a single ounce of remorse for her actions, according to this disturbing interview conducted after she was caught. It was just the intensity of it, my goodness. You know, it, there was a teacher arrested two days after me, and I saw her on TV once. So why do you think you got all the attention? I don't know. I'll say it. Do you think it's because you're pretty? I think so. South. Deborah LaFave, born August 28, 1980, was raised in Florida, where she attended East Bay High School until 96. After graduation, she had a short stint as a model posing semi-clad for different magazines due to her charming looks and mesmerizing body. But eventually, she got a degree in English from the University of South Florida and then got hired as an English teacher at the Greco Middle School in Temple Terrace, Florida. During her first year on the job, she would marry Owen Lefebvre, who, according to her story, was quite insecure due to her good looks. But never in Owen's wildest dreams would he have thought that this very stunning wife of his would not only cheat on him, but would do so with a student from her class. Something along the lines of, I think Debbie's having an affair to my mom, and he thought it was with one of my fellow teachers. He never dreamed it was with one of your students. Never. This illicit relationship began when Deborah noticed a boy in her class who showed romantic interest in her. He was extremely flirtatious, making her realize he wanted something which she didn't mind giving. May 2004. Lafave and this student went to see his cousin in Ocala, but when they got there, Deborah gave his cousin the keys to the car to drive around while she moved to the back of the seat to have in her with the boy. The incident marked one of the many more occasions Lefebvre and her student got romantically involved. They met all the time, once in her house, a dozen other times in the car, and more disturbingly, in her classroom. When asked what was really going through her mind during the entire escapade, Deborah's replies were as shocking as her actions. You had sex with this student while his cousin drove the car. It's a pretty brazen thing to do. Were you scared? Even if he's not 14 and you're 23. Make what you want of that reply, but aren't you wondering how exactly she got caught? One of the times they drove to Ocala to see the boy's cousin, his aunt was alarmed at seeing him in the company of this provocatively dressed woman, prompting her to alert the boy's mother. His mom drilled him, and the boy admitted that this was his teacher, Lefebvre. His mother, in turn, alerted the cops, and they bugged the boy's phone, recording his conversations with Lefebvre. On June 21st, 2004, officers asked the boy to lure Lefebvre to his house, which he did, and the moment she arrived, she was arrested. Deborah Lefebvre pled guilty to lewd or lascivious battery against her student who was under the age of consent. That offense carried a sentence of 5 to 15 years in prison. However, in Lefebvre's case, she was only given three years of community control, otherwise known as house arrest, and seven years of offender probation. This lady got zero jail time. And if you're wondering why, well, apart from the fact that a lot of people out there believe she was very pretty and was typically the dream of every high school boy out there, the prosecution defended her, saying that offender probation in Florida is quite difficult to complete. So if she ever violated it, she'd get jail time. There are some people out there who say this is every boy's fantasy. Did you hear that? Yeah. I just think it's stupid. I can't even think of any other word to describe it. Ultimately, Lefebvre disgustingly played the victim card by claiming the reason behind her actions was a rape incident she witnessed back when she was in middle school and some bipolar disorder. You know what? I don't want to blur the lines between um, doing something as heinous as what I did and being bipolar. But yes, symptoms of bipolar definitely contributed to my mind frame. While that's still up for debate, her final words in that interview were truly disturbing. 10 years ago is different than a 14 year old today. Not in the eyes of the law. The guilt of quote unquote ratting me out. By court order, you cannot have any contact with him. No. Today, in the trial of the former Rosarian Academy teacher accused of molesting students, found under the seat of former teacher Stephen Budd's car. They found over two hours of pictures and videotapes of child abuse on those uh, devices. He'd given them candy and fake cash in exchange for sex. The girls detail all sex in the classroom during the school day as they hid under his desk. 
telling investigators if they weren't under his desk every day, it may have been every other. Ah, oh, Stephen Budd is arguably one of the sickest predators to ever walk the earth. He not only had s with at least two of his students, but also secretly videotaped about a hundred more in provocative ways. While teaching at the Rosarian Academy, a private Catholic school in West Palm Beach, during the 06-07 school year, Bud introduced an innovative system called Bud Bucks. This paper currency could be used by his students to obtain candy and other prizes. This guy would take advantage of that system, persuading two elementary students in his class to perform sexual acts with him under his desk in return for some candy. These poor students, completely naive at the time, performed oral on him underneath his table. And if they weren't doing this every day, they were certainly doing it every other day. There was also an occasion where the principal walked in but for some reason didn't notice one of the girls underneath his desk. In April 2013, Bud was arrested shortly after getting out of his apartment in West Palm Beach, Florida. That arrest came after one of his victims, a former student at Rosarian Academy, told police that Bud, who was her homeroom teacher at the time of the alleged abuse, tried contacting her years later via Facebook. The girl went on to further tell the police that one time after this act with Bud, she threw out her soiled clothing because she feared her parents would find out what had happened. And that Bud also allegedly told the girls to perform blacks on each other naked while filming with the class Polaroid camera. Now, after his arrest, Bud obviously tried denying everything, claiming that the victim tried contacting him and accusing him of those acts on Facebook. Yeah, she was accusing me of doing stuff every day in fourth grade with her. But what Bud didn't know was that before his arrest, the police had listened in on a call between him and his accuser where he discussed their escapades. And through that call, they believed he had plans to run away from Florida, prompting his arrest. Fast forward to his interrogation, and Bud confessed to getting a call from his former student. I've been baffled with her phone call to him. I just don't know what to say to her. I don't know what to say about anything. But lied about sexually abusing her or any of his students. I'm 52 years old. I have nothing ever. I've raised my three daughters on my own. He traumatized over a hundred girls, and this guy has three daughters. After hours of interrogation, Bud asked for his lawyer. This is like, there's no answer, and I, I can't piece it together either. So I'm thinking at this point, you know, I, I need a lawyer. I need to find out someone that can tell me and look at this for me. He was charged with two counts of sexual battery on a person under the age of 12. And during a time when other 18-year-olds were attending graduation parties and making their final preparations to get off to college, the two victims and some of their former classmates spent two weeks in a courtroom narrating their horrible experiences during Bud's trial. At this time, cops had also searched his car, allowing them to find more than two hours of child pornography on different devices. They also listened to calls recorded by the FBI between Bud and one of the victims as well as a testimony from a third witness who told the court how Bud fondled her and manipulated her into touching him when she was a student at St. Francis of Assisi Catholic School in Riviera Beach, Florida. The witness stated that her young mind couldn't separate the sexual contact from the special treatment and handfuls of candy he had given her, along with multiple gestures and gifts she bragged about to her family. Bud had retired as a teacher with a perfect record from different schools, had a loving family, and was a senior citizen. He could have gotten away with all those distasteful actions if he never sent that Facebook message to his former student. Now sometimes I guess justice can be delayed, but never denied. He was found guilty of all charges and sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Guilty on all counts. Stephen Budd shows no emotion, learning he'll spend the rest of his life locked up, now classified as a sexual predator. He kept coming closer to me and I would kind of walk away to the other part. He just walked up to me and then he kissed me. June 18th, 2014. Mississippi police discovered 28-year-old English teacher Jennifer Caswell in a hotel room with a male student. Caswell had resigned from her position at Hollis Middle School in Oklahoma two months earlier after rumor mills ran wild about her inappropriate relationship with a student. And the police now had undeniable evidence to confirm those suspicions. But what exactly is Jennifer's story here? Well, Jennifer Caswell, who had been married for over 10 years and had a six-year-old son, 
claims she felt isolated and neglected in her marriage, partly the reason for her actions. In this interview with Dr. Phil, she would express her loneliness left her vulnerable, making her susceptible to the flirtatious advances of a mere student. I wasn't used to getting attention um, at all. I mean, I never got complimented, never even got a birthday present. It was like living with a roommate. Now, this illicit relationship reportedly involved numerous sexual encounters in various locations, including the boy's home, her classroom, and other spots investigators believed they had their rendezvous. Initially, there was no concrete evidence against Caswell. The student, identified as MC, was placed in an in-school detention due to the rumors, removing him from Caswell's classes. However, MC returned to his regular schedule shortly after. And despite the rumors, the inappropriate behavior continued. MC was often seen driving Caswell's car and spending time with her after school. Surveillance cams captured them entering a dark classroom alone and later exiting, laughing together. That raised a ton of eyebrows, and when MC was questioned, he denied any wrongdoing and insisted that Caswell was just his teacher. But the authorities were not buying that, so they set up a sting. During the summer break, MC ran away from home and drove 650 miles from Oklahoma to Mississippi to spend the weekend with Caswell at a hotel. Authorities tracked their movements, and upon discovering them together, Caswell was immediately arrested. She eventually pled guilty to three counts of second-degree two counts of enticing a child, and one count of forcible sodomy. She was given 10 years in prison and ordered to pay a million dollars in damages to the victim and his family. However, before that, she had a rather troubling interview with Dr. Phil, where she detailed the affair's progression. She talked about her unhappy marriage and how the student's daily compliments made her feel valued, pushing her to blatantly blur the lines of professionalism when the student kissed her. I kept on saying, no, you know, we can't do this, no, no, but... I mean, he didn't, I mean, he wasn't forcing me. I mean, I could have easily just walked out of my classroom. Well, now Caswell is serving her sentence and faces a million dollar debt. While many view her as a predator, she sees it as one huge mistake that she'll probably regret for the rest of her life. He just walked up to me and then he kissed me. And then it just kind of went from there. Now it's one thing to be a bad teacher, but how about a bad principal? 11.45 p.m. September 1st, 2022. 51-year-old principal of Liberty Middle School in West Orange, New Jersey, Aretha M. Dooley Malloy, was driving on Rock Spring Road when she crashed her vehicle on a property of a home on Rock Spring Road. After attending a fundraiser at a nearby Rock Springs golf club for township councilman Bill Rutherford, who was running for mayor, the crash was brutal. Her front and rear airbags were deployed, and that front bumper was left with dents and scratches. Now, police weren't called to the scene, but there was an officer in the neighborhood who was driving past. He stopped, and this happened. You're involved in, hold on. Mrs. Malloy kept ignoring the officer's questions, and even when he pointed out the obvious, she refused to provide an answer. Look, look, look at your vehicle. I look at the vehicle. Look, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I just have to go to the bathroom. Uh, you're not understanding me. I need yes. you to look where your vehicle is, right? Yes. I need you to see that all of your airbags have deployed. Aretha Malloy had just started her first year as principal at Liberty Middle School. She'd worked as an educator for more than 20 years in multiple districts in New Jersey, including Newark and Dover. However, she was about to lose all her principals on this occasion. After the accident, Malloy's car ran into a small brick wall, a sprinkler head, and the lawn of somebody's house. At the same time, a retaining wall and a plant were damaged at the home next door. When officers asked her consent to take some breath samples, she blatantly refused. You have two options at this point, okay? You either take this test, right? Yes. Or you get locked up. I mean, if we took a shot every time she said she had to use the bathroom, we'd probably need one now, too. But anyways, Dooley Malloy was charged with driving under the influence, driving an unregistered vehicle, failure to possess an insurance card, and failure to give consent to take breath samples. In the end, no one was injured in the crash, but the property in the front of the two homes was left with some minor damage. And as for Malloy, well, she resigned the next morning. Not all evil school teachers are offenders or predators. Some are just irresponsible. 
Take the case of Kimberly Coates, who walked up in her classroom drunk as a skunk. Anything that's, you know, do you have a prescription for anything that maybe you have taken today that just seems like you're not the same person that I talked to this morning? Um, I did take a, I, I did take some medication you know, last night. Would you um, be willing to take a breathalyzer test? If I needed to, yeah. 53-year-old third grade teacher Kimberly Coates was teaching her class at Perkins Tryon Intermediate School in Oklahoma when she was taken out of that classroom on the first day of the term to meet with the school's superintendent and a police officer. She was questioned for about 40 minutes before she agreed to a breathalyzer, which kind of showed she'd been drinking a lot that morning. But for some weird reason, Coates kept denying the allegation, claiming that she only drunk a half a box of wine until 3 a.m. Now, in the body cam footage released by the Perkins Police Department, the school superintendent, Mr. Doug Ogle, accused Coates of acting weird and being off. She was then asked if she would consider taking a breath test, to which she agreed. But knowing fully well that she had obviously been drinking during school hours, she tried excusing that weird behavior for some alleged anxiety medication that she had taken earlier. But if you're gonna lie, you gotta think things through, people, because she couldn't provide the bottle of medication she claimed to have taken. So she doubles down, saying she put the anxiety pill in her pocket and had taken it earlier in the day. I mean, come on, <laughs> come on. But to everyone in that room, her lies were just not making any sense. All right, so you're, you're gonna blow into it like you're blowing up a balloon, okay? And you're gonna keep blowing until I tell you stop. Until I tell you to stay, until I tell you stop, okay? You gonna tell me the truth? How much you have to drink? I drank last night. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Coates' breath produced a measurement of 0.24%. That's exactly three times the legal limit. Anything higher than 0.08 is considered legally impaired by the U.S. They asked her two questions. Did you leave school today and is there alcohol in your classroom? She said that she didn't leave school, but didn't say anything about the alcohol in her class. And while she continued to maintain the last time she drank was at 3 a.m., Ogle told her that she needed to have someone come and pick her up and take her home. Also stating that she's fired. Well, my recommendation to the board is going to be to terminate you because you're under the influence. Or you can resign. You, you won't give me like a second chance no. or anything? She kept acting weird and even refused to call her husband to come pick her up. I want to work here. Yeah. Uh, so tomorrow at 9 o'clock, now let's call somebody and have them pick you up. No, I, I can't call my husband. Ogle went and grabbed her things and returned with a blue cup that contained wine. Please, 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 please. I'll, I'll, I'll call somebody. I have somebody right here in town that will nope. come get me. Too late. Please. What's your date of birth, Kimberly? No, I don't want to. Do you want to go to jail with no. multiple charges? No. Put your hands behind your back. Mrs. Coates eventually got arrested, but her story didn't end there. November 6th, 2023. During Mrs. Coates' court hearing, an on-duty deputy at the Payne County Courthouse saw her coming in a little wobbly. The deputy noticed her glazed eyes and her speech was a little slow and slurred. Watching those cameras, he tracked her movements and then finally approached her. She claimed to have just had one glass of wine. But if that's the case, what kind of wine was she drinking? She was then taken downstairs to the front desk at the security checkpoint, handcuffed, and taken to the Payne County Jail. Now, she's dealing with two intoxication charges. Um, the next step is basically you, you do go to jail Great. tonight. Um, I submit some paperwork. I'm little. They're going to tear me apart. Brittany Zamora was a pretty messed up teacher that no one could have seen coming from a mile away. She graduated with honors at Arizona State, maintaining a perfect 4.0 GPA throughout both her undergrad and graduate studies. And with her impressive academic record, she began her teaching career at Littleton Elementary School in Avondale, where she was named Teacher of the Year in 2016. Her success led her to a new position as a sixth grade teacher at Las Brisas Academy. But this would be the point her seemingly perfect life changed for the worse. In 2017, Zamora made an offhand comment to her student. I'm gonna be out of school, so if you get bored, text me, because I'll be really bored. Seemed like a random comment, but one of her students took her up on that offer by initiating a text conversation that quickly turned inappropriate. 
Their exchanges were pretty flirtatious and eventually would escalate into professing their feelings for each other. By the time she returned, students in Zamora's class noticed her favoritism towards this particular student and even reported it to the principal. When questioned, Zamora denied any inappropriate behavior. However, her actions only escalated. February 16th, 2018. She told the student to sneak out of his grandparents' house, where he was staying for the weekend. They met up in a parked car and engaged in oral sex. The next day, they had another sexual encounter at the same house. And about a month later, they had intercourse in her classroom after a school talent show. A friend of the victim even witnessed them touching each other, and was once asked by Zamora to act as a lookout while she had sex with the student in class. I mean, that reckless behavior eventually led to their discovery. The victim's stepmother had this parental monitoring app on his phone that flagged suspicious activity. And on March 21st, 2018, she got an alert about a repeated use of the word baby from an Instagram account named Mrs. Zamora. Recognizing the name from previous contact, she informed the victim's father, who confronted his son. The boy eventually confessed to everything, prompting his parents to notify the school's principal, who would then contact the police. March 22, 2018, Brittany was arrested and charged with nine counts of sexual conduct with a minor, two counts of child molestation, and one count of transmitting obscene material to a minor, all felonies. During her interrogation, Zamora broke down upon learning she would be jailed, which, if we're being honest, is a stark contrast to her previous disregard for boundaries. I mean, how could she not see something like this coming? Just look at her. Um, I do know, um, I'm not going to ask you any more questions because you said you wanted an attorney, so um, did you have any more questions for me? For over a year after her arrest, Zamora denied the allegations and refused to speak to the media. But eventually, she did plead guilty to sexually assaulting her student and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Unlike Kimberly, Amanda Hickey can't be classified as an evil, twisted school teacher, but in her case, her gross negligence led to the death of a child under her care. Now, for context, Amanda was the owner and operator of a daycare center in Dunwoody, Georgia. Known as an experienced caregiver, Hickey's daycare was trusted by many parents in the community until one tragic incident changed that narrative. February 3rd, 2021, a baby in Amanda's daycare, identified as Charlie Cronmiller, was found unresponsive, lying face down in a crib. Emergency services were called and the infant was rushed to the hospital, but unfortunately, the baby was pronounced dead shortly after arrival. So, what exactly happened? I can show you my, um, I was quite... Maggie. I was out. So I, 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 I dialed it. The DeKalb County District Attorney's Office found evidence of gross negligence on the part of Amanda Hickey. In footage obtained from an officer's body cam, Amanda claimed to have put the baby down on his back, but later investigations revealed that she placed him down on his stomach, a position widely known to increase the risk of sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS. Further investigation revealed that Hickey had left the baby unattended for over two hours and failed to follow proper sleep safety protocols while she falsified records to cover up her actions. So you said you put him down at what time? Um, a little bit after 2 o'clock, I believe. That would be his normal schedule, like 2 or 2.30. And then he would typically, um, he would have slept and had a bottle of sleep. Following that investigation, Amanda was indicted on multiple charges, including second-degree murder and cruelty to children. She appeared in court on several occasions, where evidence of her negligence and failure to adhere to basic safety protocols was presented. The prosecution argued that Hickey's actions directly led to the infant's death and highlighted her attempt to mislead authorities by falsifying records. And that was enough for the judge and jury to slam her with the maximum sentence. October 2023 Amanda Hickey's trial concluded. The jury found her guilty of all charges, leaving the judge to sentence her to 30 years behind bars. Soto allegedly asked a young girl to come up to his classroom to fix her test while the other students were in PE class. Soto is accused of the girl in that Castle Creek Elementary School classroom. 49-year-old Julio Soto had been working at Castle Creek Elementary since August 2015, where he tutored fifth graders. This guy was an active member of the military and considered an upstanding citizen, until his depraved actions on a student exposed who he truly was. 
March 2019. Soto was arrested at a public shopping plaza in Florida after a female student in his class accused him of inappropriate touching. The incident had occurred a month earlier when the student had sprained her arm during a PE class, and although Soto tutored her class in the afternoon, the injured student was unable to participate in the following PE activities, leading Soto to take advantage of her situation. He approached her as she sat on the side, asking her to come upstairs with him to fix one of her tests. Unfortunately, the only fixing that was about to go down was Soto's thirst for depravity. The student agreed to go with him to his classroom on the second floor, but once they got there, Soto told this girl that he was going to try to find her tickle spot and began touching her above her clothing and eventually underneath it. The girl would tell him to stop, which he did, but went ahead to touch her again and again until she was done with the supposed test. He then told her to go back downstairs, since PE class was almost over, and when she asked if anyone could have seen him, he responded by saying there was a privacy paper placed over the door, so no one could have seen what happened. But even with that, the student felt too disgusted and embarrassed to discuss the situation with anyone, until she did summon up the courage to tell a classmate about it, who in turn told her own parents. But here's the thing, apart from the girl's testimony and surveillance cameras picking up the moment when they went into Soto's classroom, there wasn't any more evidence to suggest that he was guilty. And that's what kind of made this interrogation really disturbing. I said, well, if you, when you, after specials, if your arm still hurts, let me know. If you're in my classroom in the afternoon and it continues bothering you and you haven't done anything yet, then go let me know and I'll send you to the nurse. This guy couldn't even remember if the girl was wearing a sling, but he could remember every conversation they had in verbatim. The detectives used their usual tactics to downplay the situation and get Soto to confess. Why am I being told by different people? I touched oh my gosh. Why is that coming up? Help me understand. I, 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 I wish I could. But after almost an hour, they finally broke through and got something. I don't know why we're holding on to this. There are cameras in the classroom, you know about them. They're showing me what happened. Tell me. Just tell me. Can I have my lawyer? Of course they didn't get any confession. This man was in the military. He knew their tactics. He did sound a little guilty and eventually accepted a plea deal that got him supervised probation and required him to register as a sex offender. Rutherford was one evil school teacher who got caught on the show to catch a predator. But unlike the other evil teachers so far, Rutherford almost got away with his manipulative antics. James was a sixth grade teacher at St. Margaret of York Catholic School in Loveland, Ohio. He was also the track coach. But back at home, he was having some marital issues and was seeking a divorce from his wife. At the time of the sting operation, 26-year-old Rutherford met and chatted up a decoy online, pretending to be a 13-year-old girl named Danica. They talked about all kinds of things, including and at one point, Rutherford even set up a webcam session with the decoy, where he took off his shirt to flex. And soon after, he agreed to meet up with her. But he became suspicious and started having second thoughts, making him state in their chat that he wasn't coming over to do anything. Ultimately, Rutherford arrived at the Sting House. But instead of meeting the decoy he had communicated with, he meets Chris Hansen, the host of the show. Rutherford admitted that he had a problem and that he had talked to other girls online, but this was actually the first time he tried linking up with any of them. No, obviously. Do you do this often? No, this is the first time I've ever done this. This is the first time. You know, because I've heard that a lot. I'm sure you have. Jimmy tried defending himself, but his chats with the decoy weren't helping anything. Plus, Hanson noted that being a teacher and harboring such thoughts was definitely a problem. Nonetheless, while interrogated, Rutherford tried playing the pity card, repeating the fact that he had never done anything like that before. I didn't even really want to come. I told the guy over there I don't know why I was coming. I, my, my mind's only stopped. She's a kid. I am a teacher. I've never done anything like this before. This guy tried to blame his divorce for his perversions. I don't remember what I was talking to about getting a divorce. I mean, I just... I don't know. I know that sounds like bull. But, and your question, I don't know. The Greenville police notified the school where Jimmy worked, and he was fired immediately. After which, a mother of a female student of his called the sheriff's office to thank him for arresting Rutherford, claiming that he had groomed her daughter while he was still working in education. Now, initially, Rutherford tried to fight the charges against him in court. 
However, he was also involved in another chat with a decoy operation in Indiana, while simultaneously chatting with Danica. The undercover cop working for the Carmel Police Department identified Rutherford and notified the Greenville Police. This guy had seven pending felonies in that case because he once masturbated in front of the decoy during a webcam session, but ended up not being convicted. This led Rutherford to his guilty plea to the original charges and decided not to go to trial. Now, considering the severity of some of the things he said and did, he received a relatively tame sentence, which was just 45 days in county jail, 40 hours of community service, $2,000 in court fees, and fines from his failed supervision hearing. They also told him not to contact any minors under any circumstances, not possess any drugs, fear alcohol, and he had to register as a offender in the state of Ohio for life. <laughs>